we've been on. Oh, okay. <laughs>
sort of a different poem. Um, it's amazing to me how much that poem is able to contain in its modest little uh, package that it presents itself in there. I think one of the things that fascinates me most about it is all of the different ways of seeing or perceiving that are represented in it. It's kind of a master class in how to pay attention and be a poet, I feel like. I was thinking about this the other evening. It begins from the perspective of a human being regarding an inchworm, right? This yellow striped green caterpillar. And it informs me of something I didn't know, I guess, about inchworms, which is that they are caterpillars. I, when I think of caterpillar, when I hear that word, I think of something long-bodied with a lot of legs underneath it carrying it along. I don't think of an inchworm, in part because we call it a worm, and in part because, it, as he points out, it doesn't have all of those legs. It only has one set of legs at either end, or maybe, maybe it's two. But in any case, it lacks a full set of legs. Um, so already I'm learning from the poem, but it's being told thus far from the point of view of a human being regarding a caterpillar. But then he says, this yellow-striped green caterpillar climbing up the steep window screen Steep is such an unusual adjective to choose to describe a window screen, isn't it? If you and I were walking down the street together and I said, look at that window screen over there, that's, that's pretty steep. <laughs> You'd look at me like I have lost my ever-loving mind, right? What is this guy talking about? But it's the perfect adjective to use there because, of course, he's now exchanged the human perspective for the inchworm's perspective. From the perspective of some little thing that has to climb that screen, that screen is really steep, right? It's sheer. Uh, and so there's a wonderful sort of sympathy in that choice of adjective. This yellow striped green caterpillar climbing up the steep window screen, it recognizes that this is a schlep, a labor for this caterpillar. Uh, so already we've been introduced to two different perspectives, the humans and the caterpillars. We're not even through the first sentence yet. This yellow striped green caterpillar climbing up the steep window screen constantly for lack of a full set of legs now, we've been told what's there. Now we've been told what's not there as well, right? If you want to be a successful poet, you have to look at the world and see not only what is there, but what is lacking as well, what, what is absent. Uh, it's a poverty in the life of this caterpillar, particularly at moments when it's trying to lug its long body up a window screen. It's a poverty that it lacks the full set of legs that other, other caterpillars might have. Constantly, for lack of a full set of legs, keeps humping up its back. That's the predicate of the sentence, by the way. And now we've completed the first sentence. And I love it that the sentence, this is a thing that really skilled poets do that I think a lot of contemporary poets fail to do. There's a lot of, there's a tendency in contemporary poetry to write a sentence in which it exhausts all of its syntactic energy right away. But then the sentence continues, just kind of accumulating description after that. The, the subject accomplishes the predicate in the first clause, and then there's just piled on uh, modifier phrases, like participial phrases after that. And the sentence goes on forever, but there's no suspense in reading the sentence anymore because it's already done the main thing it's gonna do. Does that make any sense, what, what I'm saying? This is more like what's called a periodic sentence, right? The subject is caterpillar, which comes early in the sentence, this yellow striped green caterpillar. And then we get modification in the middle, but we haven't had the predicate yet. Climbing up the steep window screen, constantly for lack of a full set of legs, and then at the end of it arrives a predicate, keeps humping up its back. And we're attentive as readers to that sentence the whole time uh, because we're waiting for that predicate to arrive. We're waiting for the sentence syntactically to be resolved, and that's a way of heightening the alertness of the reader, I think. I also think, and I may be, uh, I don't know, torturing the metaphor a little bit here, but I think that that kind of sentence is kind of like an inchworm. It's got the subject and the predicate are the two pairs of legs. It's got one pair at one end and one pair at the other, and it's not until the two sets of legs finally come together that the thing can actually ambulate, that the sentence can actually, can actually move. Uh, Wilbur is very skilled at, at uh, keeping your eye on what he's up to, keeping him attentive all along. So that's sentence number one, this yellow striped green caterpillar climbing up the steep window screen constantly for lack of a full set of legs keeps humping up its back. And we've seen the human perspective, we've seen the inchworm's perspective, we've seen what's there, and we've seen what's not there. And now the sentence takes a little bit of a, or the poem takes a little bit of a meditative turn. It's as if he sent, by a sort of semaphore, dark omegas meant to warn of last things. The poem just got serious, didn't it? <laughs> 
I thought we were just reading about an inchworm on a window screen here, but suddenly we've got dark omegas warning of last things. And in the poem, it's capital L, capital T, last things. Um, so now we've, we've seen what's literally there in the first sentence and what's literally not there in the first sentence, the lack of a full set of legs. In the second, second sentence, we see what's figuratively there. The poet turns on his uh, metaphor-making imagination, or simile-making imagination in, in this case. It's as if he said, by a sort of semaphore, dark omegas meant to warn of last things. What's a semaphore? Who can give me a working definition of semaphore? You got it. That's right. It's a it's a language or a form of communication through visual signals when uh, vocal language isn't available. So when you see the guy on the tarmac at the airport signaling with flags or cones to the pilot, helping the pilot guide the, the landed airplane into the gate there, he's communicating with semaphore with the sorts of signals um, because language spoken language isn't available to the two of them in that in that instance. Um, so it's as if the caterpillar sent by a sort of semaphore, dark omegas. What's omega? Very good. Yeah, he's drawing a horseshoe shape, right? And not just a horseshoe shape. It's the shape of an inchworm with its back humped up, isn't it? <laughs> isn't that fantastic? What does omega represent? The end. The end. Last things. I am the alpha and the omega. It's the last character in the Greek alphabet. And so when we see omegas, we naturally are put in mind of last things. It's a risk when you're writing a poem, especially a seemingly lighthearted poem, and it suddenly takes this dark turn, like, look, I have introduced death to the poem. It can seem forced or heavy-handed, right, to do that if it doesn't arise naturally out of the poem. The, the beautiful thing about this poem is that an inchworm with its back humped up is indisputably an omega. That is vis visually what it is. And so the metaphor is just offering itself to him there. He doesn't have to force the poem to turn toward reflecting on end times or last things or mortality uh, because the visual suggestion has literally been made by the physical thing that he's observing. It's as if he sent by a sort of semaphore, dark omegas meant to warn of last things. That's sentence number two. So now we've seen from the human point of view what's literally there, from the caterpillar's point of view what's being confronted, we've seen what's not there, and now we've seen what's figuratively there, um, the appearance of an omega and what an omega in turn signifies. All of these different ways of perceiving contained in this little poem. Now the poem suddenly lightens a little bit. Although he doesn't know it, he will soon have wings. I love that line. I absolutely love it, or that series of lines there. Um, I think that dark omega is meant to warn of last things is just enough darkness for me for this for purposes of this poem, and I'm I'm wanting it to uh, have a little bit of levity or levitation introduced uh, to it there at precisely the moment that his thought turns and he says, although he doesn't know it, he will soon have wings. I hadn't known that either. As I said, I didn't know an inchworm was a caterpillar, but I suppose if an inchworm is a caterpillar, and I trust that Richard Wilbur is right about this because he once said. The, the least a poet can do is get the science right. <laughs> uh, then the inchworm must be some sort of a larval form of a, of a butterfly or a moth. And so it is going to have wings before too long. And it doesn't know it. I think it's probably safe to say that the inchworm does not know. It might intuit it, but I think it's safe to say that the inchworm doesn't know that it will soon have wings. So now the poet is seeing the future, right? The poet has seen uh, what's there, what's not there, what's figuratively there, what's there from multiple perspectives, and now the poet sees what's going to be there in the future, which is something the caterpillar itself cannot see. And in that moment, the poet um, occupies a sort of a godlike position. It's looking down on the, the lowly inchworm and knowing its future, knowing what uh, the future holds in store for it, uh, even though the caterpillar doesn't. And it's good news. It, you sense that he would like to be able to tell the caterpillar this good news if he could. Although he doesn't know it, he will soon have wings. But then the poem complicates one more time. It turns again. And I, too, don't know. It sort of occurs to himself here. And I, too, don't know toward what undreamt condition, inch by inch, I go. Now he does the final act of perceiving, and maybe the most impressive of them all, which is to step outside of himself and to see himself perceiving the world and to see what he can and what he cannot perceive. 
the poem has looked at things from every point of view, and finally, it looks at the poet looks at himself. Um, and in that moment, he cedes his godlike position and acknowledges that he and the inchworm are effectively one and the same. Who knows what eye is looking down on me, and, and as I make my uh, inchworm-like increments of progress through the human world, and thinks, although he doesn't know it, <laughs> he will soon have wings. Um, the inchworm and the poet are brothers at the end of this poem, right? Uh, and he solidifies that, that comparison there by the use of inch by inch in that final line. It's the only time the word inch is ever used in the poem is in that final line. It's called a measuring worm. It's not called an inchworm. And I, too, don't know toward what undreamt condition, inch by inch, I go. Even the, the way that that sentence is assembled syntactically is perfect for the poem's purposes, isn't it? Because it's sort of halting and careful and deliberative. We're, we're waiting yet again for a verb to arrive that arrives only at the tail end of the sentence to know in what direction the sentence is trying to head. And all of those little commas that slow it down, the, the sentence makes it, and I too don't know toward what undreamt condition, inch by inch, I go. <laughs> you see what I'm saying with these little phrases, these little doled out phrases that allow the poem to make a, a, a progress that's sort of imitative of the, the progress that it describes. So how many perspectives is that? It's the human perspective regarding the caterpillar. It's the caterpillar's perspective on the world, looking at the steep window screen. It's, uh, it's perceiving what's not there, the lack of a full set of legs. It's perceiving what's there figuratively. It's as if he sent by a sort of semaphore. Um, it is seeing what's going to be there in the future, although he doesn't know that he will soon have wings. And then finally, it's uh, stepping outside of oneself uh, an ecstatic experience. Isn't that what ecstasis, uh, the, the Greek term is defined as, standing outside of oneself? Uh, it steps outside of itself and uh, regards itself. And so he sees himself seeing, and he also sees what he cannot see, um, or acknowledges his own lack of, of sight. So seven or eight perspectives in this tiny little poem composed in these little haiku length stanzas. That happened to rhyme, too. Did you notice that? They rhyme on the first and third lines. It's almost inaudible because it's so heavily in jammed, you know, it's the, the rhymes come in the middle of phrases and clauses, but this yellow striped green caterpillar climbing up the steep window screen constantly for lack of a full set of legs keeps pumping up his back. It's as if he sent by a sort of semaphore dark omegas meant to warn of last things, although he doesn't know it, he will soon have wings. And I too don't know toward what undreamt condition, inch by inch, I go. And so casual and conversational and uh, so artful while seemingly uh, artless. Um, it's, a, it's just a master class. And uh, I don't know that I'll ever write a poem like that, but I'm willing to spend my life trying to because I think it's <laughs> worth doing. <laughs> it's the kind of poem that gets me up in the morning and gets me to my desk again. Do you all have observations about that poem that you'd like to share? Uh, any additional thing that I'm neglecting to mention? Because obviously I can talk about it till the cows come home. <laughs> Which in Northeast Kansas is not a metaphor. That's a good one. <laughs> could, could I, have, I have an observation. Could the caterpillar, its transition into becoming a butterfly near the end of it, could it be representative of um, death and then maybe some sort of angelic heaven-like relationship? I certainly am thinking that as I read the poem. I, I'm trying not to bring too much contextual information to it, like my knowledge that Richard Wilbur is a man in his 80s as he's writing this poem and is maybe reflecting on uh, you know, mortality and what the future holds in store. But undeniably, when you put last things, the words last things in a poem and the omega in a omega. poem, and you put uh, transformation from an earthbound creature to a creature with wings, you know, a creature of, capable of literal physical transcendence of its circumstances, then you would invite all of that into the poem. Uh, I think that that's absolutely something that he's reflecting on. You know, the, the caterpillar's transformation into a winged creature will be a um, another life phase. But when he says, I too don't know toward what undreamt condition, inch by inch I go, he's clearly thinking about a transformation to something beyond life. And I think he's liking the idea that, you know, the, the wings are, are a possibility there. Yeah. <laughs> like, like having that image in play in that conversation. Yeah. Very good. Okay. Thank you.
Well, you know, I really like the thing you said about the, the omega coming in so naturally from the physical shape of the word. Yes. And 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 that therefore it doesn't he doesn't have to apologize for it. Right. And it actually seems to give him freedom to actually play with it because he said dark omegas. Right. right. And end times or it's last things. Last things. Yeah. Yeah. And it was so heavily like it brings in in that one word that omega just brings in the whole religious context. Right. And he actually becomes playful with it. Yes. Yeah. Uh, which I don't think he could. I think he had to do that. Yeah. Otherwise, it would seem kind of that Omega would seem like he's trying to slip it. In. Right. Right. It sets it out. It's yeah. got to just arrive, and yeah, and being playful in a way that calls attention to it, you know, rather than seeming sort of uh, self-conscious or defensive about its use. I think that's really important to to the poem success. Yeah. It's a poem with. I mean, in addition to being a poem about being both earthbound and being able to. Um, you know, elevate oneself or, or rise up or transcend. It's, it's a poem that mixes levity and gravity in as much as it mixes the seriousness with that playfulness, that, that light quality there. And I love poems that have both, that don't feel that a poem that's serious can't be funny or that a poem that's funny can't be serious or that's witty, you know, can't be um, serious as well. Yeah, it's the hardest thing to do to achieve really natural metaphors that are exactly what you. Um, what you need for artistic purposes, but also that seems sort of summoned by the imagery that you're writing about. There's a, a poet named Albert Goldbart who teaches at Wichita State University. I don't know if any of you are familiar with him. Say what? Go Shockers. Go Shockers, that's right, yeah. He's fantastic. Uh, he's won the National Book Critics Circle Award twice. He's a real virtuoso, and, and he he's a, a great metaphor maker. I think in one this poem in particular, he's prolific, and so there, there are hundreds of these, but um, he, he has a poem called Why I Believe in Ghosts, and it's all, all of these um, reasons. Uh, each stands as sort of its own reason of supporting this belief in ghosts. He has, and one of them is um, because we all have unfinished business. Cecil's missing hand is unfinished business. His hook is a question mark that never relents. <laughs> yeah. And you know what I mean? That's what I mean about the image just being available without having to be forced into the poem. You know, I, I went to school with a, a girl in grade school who, who had a missing hand and wore a hook. And it is in the shape of a question mark, you know. And when Cecil, who knows how Cecil lost his hand, but maybe he was born without the hand, or maybe he lost it in an industrial accident or a car accident or something like that. But when he looks at that hook and sees that literal physical question mark, that would be a daily reminder or representation of this unfinished business. This it's the big what if of his life, you know, and uh, and it's unforced because the question mark is actually physically there. It is literally physically there as well as being there in the um, figurative sense. That's so sort of full of other implications. And so, but you got to wait around for those metaphors to show up, or you got to keep your eye out for them. You know, they're they're not uh, they're not uh, growing on trees. You know? <laughs> so, yeah. You know, it's interesting. Often we we promote things in, in importance by giving them initial caps. You know, um, maybe he's meant meaning to say not just um, to warn of last things um, uh, in in a local sense or in a sense that's specific to the context in which the poem is being written, but last things more broadly. You know, the beginning and the end, uh, and I mean the end with a capital E. You know, <laughs> uh, yeah, I think that that's. Uh, uh, you know, an effort to give it just a little bit of extra weight and, and resonance there. Yeah, I suppose. Go ahead. I think it, that's an interesting thought. And um, when you think of coming Emily Dickinson thing to do, uh, I, I really think that Emily Dickinson's capitals are part of her punctuation. Yes. And they sort of make, unconsciously make the, the speaker reading it. And I think stuff's meant to be read out loud. Yeah. yeah. Especially when you read uh, But it makes the reader allowed, uh, even even though I didn't know it when when, it, when you were reading it, that it was capitalized. I'm sure it influenced what you said. Yeah, yeah. Uh, there's, a, there's a great poem by William Matthews. He has a series of poems about the jazz um, bassist and band leader, Charles Mingus. And uh, there's a poem called Mingus in Diaspora, in which he talks about uh, 
and I guess is sort of a mentor of younger musicians. And he says, um, you have to pick up the bass, as Mingus called his, with audible capitals. <laughs> and in the poem, it's the bass, capital T, capital B, but he refers to it as audible capitals. When Mingus said, you have to pick up the bass, uh, you could hear the capital T and the capital B. Yeah, it, it comes through in a sense. Hey, let me share another poem with you really quickly by another American, roughly contemporary, Richard Wilbers, uh, who also uses uh, sort of surprising initial caps just in one instance in, in the poem. When I say the words mostly good, uh, that's a capital M and a capital G. This is another short poem by Gwendolyn Brooks. It's called The Bean Eaters. They eat beans mostly, this old yellow pear. Dinner is a casual affair. Plain chipware on a plain and creaking wood. Tin flatware. Two who are mostly good. Two who have lived their day, but keep on putting on their clothes and putting things away. And remembering, remembering with twinklings and twinges as they lean over the beans in their rented back room that is full of beads and receipts and dolls and cloths, tobacco crumbs, vases and fringes. That little poem is so quiet. Um, it, it can go right by you pretty easily. And it did the first time that I read it. I think I was in college, I read that poem. I liked Wendell Brooks, and I read that poem and thought, okay, old couple, eat beans, I got it. <laughs> nothing else happens in this poem. And it's true that virtually nothing happens in the poem. In fact, if we're talking about grammar or syntax, uh, only the first two lines are actual sentences. They eat beans mostly, this old yellow pear. Dinner is a casual affair. Everything after that is just accumulated description, the sort of thing that I was uh, um, being critical of uh, earlier. It's, I think she's very deliberately attempting to render a poem that's almost a still life, almost like a painting of a life to, among other things, um, bring home how little activity there is in the life of this old yellow pair, how circumscribed and closed off their, their life is at this point. I always share that poem with students and uh, ask them what they know about the couple that's not explicitly stated in the poem. What's something that you all could tell me about that old couple and about their life that's not stated outright? I love that poem. And the reason I like it is because of the very end. I think the end is like so much. Isn't it's it good. great? Yeah. Because it's, it's all those memories that are there and all those things that, that yes. they put away. Yes. And yeah. then they, there's all those things that, that are there, the tobacco and the things that come in at the end of that, that poem. long catalog at the end oh, of the poem. Oh, it's yeah. like they're just like, have lived their lives and they have all these things. And, and, then, and then the line where they remember some things with, uh, twi with twi twinklings and twinges. Twinges. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Isn't that marvelous? I love that poem. That pair of words, twinklings and twinges, twinges yeah. they're such physically similar words. They, in fact, both contain the word twin, you know, in them. And yet they feel like they represent the two opposite poles of the memory Absolutely. spectrum. You know, the entire, the activity of remembering will invariably if you're doing it for any length of time, contain both twinklings and twinges. You know, you remember your first kiss and your eyes just light up, and but then the first kiss is attached to some sort of heartbreak or loss after that, and you can't stop memory when it's going like that. You know, you can't choose just to remember the first kiss and then not what came after that. And so you're on your way to a twinge if you've just had a twinkling, you know, and, and uh, the, the things are inextricable, you know, and the, the, the similarity of those two words, twinklings and twinges, I think, reinforces how inextricable they are and how uh, that, that, that loss and devastation and regret is just the other side of the coin of love and joy. Yeah. Um, and yeah, that's beautiful. And, and that catalog is, is fantastic, isn't it? You can, you can talk for 20 minutes about each item in that catalog as they lean over the beans in their rented back room that is full of beads and receipts and dolls and cloths tobacco crumbs, vases and fringes, 
She wants you to savor each one, I think. That's why she puts and in between them rather than commas in between them. So it's not a list that you can just rush over it, but it's full of beads, receipts, dolls, cloths, tobacco, crummy. Mm -hmm. It's um, beads and receipts, a sense of abundance. They're swelling to fill the apartment. And if you look at that poem, it's fascinating um, how it's laid out. The, the, the last couple of lines are indented, which suggests that they're actually not their own lines, but are a continuation of the line that precedes them. It's in general a short line poem, but um, those indentations there of what well, usually two lines at the tail end of the poem suggest that in fact the poem's final line is um, in their rented back room that is full of beads and receipts and dolls and cloths, tobacco crumbs, vases and fringes. That whole thing is meant to be a single line of poetry. So in other words, if Gwendolyn Brooks had an infinitely wide piece of paper to write the poem on, the poem would mostly be here, but then the last line would go all the way out you know, to here. Um, it's a poem about material poverty, right? If we think about the circumstances of their lives, but it's also a poem about material abundance and an abundance of memories and maybe even an abundance of love too, although that is understa un um, unstated explicitly. It's just sort of immanent in the poem. It's sort of implicit. Yeah. I don't think it really is because, I'm sorry, but I do love this poem. Go ahead, yeah, yeah, good. I just think, I mean, the, the picture of the old couple, I mean, they're old and they're together and they're still sharing a meal. Yeah. Significant to her. 
uh, or they are dolls that um, are remnants of when they had children in the house, which suggests another kind of abundance or richness in their lives, or they are dolls that they keep on hand because grandchildren come to visit them. Um, and they want to give the grandchildren something to play with in this little room. And any one of those things makes those dolls seem really, and the fact that they have held on to those dolls seem like a little clue to a, a larger experience than exists in, in this seemingly claustrophobic little, little room that they occupy. Uh, a friend of mine says the most heartbreaking word in the whole poem is the word rented because they're elderly, you know, and they're still renting. And it's a singular room, you know, it's not even rooms, it's not an apartment, it's their rented back room. And it's a back room too, so it's probably dimly lit. It doesn't have the big picture windows that the front room would have. It's the less expensive of the rooms. Wendell Brooks was writing a lot about the experiences of African Americans sort of on society's margins in the 1950s and 60s when she wrote this poem in, in a city like Chicago. And, um, and that was really something new to American poetry, was looking at these lives that had sort of been overlooked for so long. But, but it makes words like rented and back and old, when you bring them all together, seem very significant. And receipts in that catalog at the end. I think receipts is so poignant mm -hmm. because it's proof of ownership, you know, to these old people who have been denied so much in terms of ownership and rights throughout their lives that those receipts that they have saved may be to a can opener they bought 25 years ago, and they're not gonna take it back for a refund or something like that, but they own it. it there it is, there's proof that they own this thing. You can't take it away from them. But yeah. you know, the other thing I love about it too, is this is one of the people that you mentioned it because even when I read that poem, in my mind, I mean, just picturing it in my mind, I've always pictured them as a set. Oh, that's interesting. And that's interesting. so that's what makes the poem so good. Right. Because she was, she did write about black people. I mean, <clears throat> and and I know that right. you know about her, but still, you don't have to know that about her. Right, I mean, that's right. When you read the poem, it could be anything. It does not require that. That's right. I mean, yeah. it's so universal. I mean, that's I think that's part of the beauty of it. Really. Yes, yeah. Well, she even in the first line she says this old yellow yeah. hair, yeah. and yellow is on the one hand a term that 50, 75 years ago African Americans would sometimes use to describe other light-skinned African Americans, and that may be what she means, but yellow is also just a word that we associate with age, you know, newspapers yellow as they get older, and it's sort of the color that we associate with, you know, jaundice or just fading, you know, and um, there's no, nothing is, there's no single interpretation of the poem that is correct and to the exclusion of other interpretations. It's, it's um, so particular to the lives of these individuals, and yet it's so open to, uh, it's any poem that you that you want it to be because of the, the care with which the language has been chosen, and and it's a new one every time I go back to it too, and it's so so brief, but it's just it's enriched my life for a quarter century now. Um, yeah, and poetry can do that in, in a way that other other forms of writing can't so much for me. I, I love a good novel, I love a good short story, but that compression, that density, and that intensity of experience that a poem can give you, sometimes with the lightest of imaginable touches, um, is is something that I. Uh, admire and, and grateful for and, and aspire to in my own writing. Yeah. That, what you just said, I just sort of, it actually gets better and better the more you look at it. Yes, yeah. I really am a fan of sound and, and, and rhyme if it's used well. And it's only what Yates said that when he started writing the ear instead of for the eye, he yes. started writing good stuff. Yes. <clears throat> but that poem established itself as a rhyming poem pretty gently. Then it comes out with the word, yeah. And I, I immediately started thinking, what's that going to rhyme How are you, you going to rhyme with that? It was a long time before it yeah. <laughs> no. It, it made until me wait until the last word. That's that. right. Yeah. It was a conspicuous word waiting for a rhyme. Yeah. I don't know whether there was anything to rhyme until after that. That's right. Or not, because I, I just was listening to the items of the list. Not until you get to fringes, yeah. And if you've got a rhyme that is that conspicuous, it's probably strategically wise to put some space in between so that it doesn't kind of clang, you know, when it when it arrives. But but there is delight, I think, in the expectation of a rhyme when you've heard a word like that and wondering how the author will uh, resolve it. And it's challenging when you pick an, an unusual sound pairing like that. My students, you know, are constantly rhyming in sort of the Dr. Seuss way, where they'll they'll throw the word that they want out there, and then they're like, well, now I've got to come up with something to rhyme with that. So let me just you know drag whatever needs to be. Hands and hogtied and dragged into the poem, right? You know, but the fringes just show up like the 
the rhyme has got to arrive just the way that a good metaphor does, as though it was going to be what you, that, that's what you were going to say anyway, regardless of whether it rhymed. It's got to seem as natural as leaves to a tree, you know, to borrow a phrase from, from John Keats. And, and uh, yeah, Wendland Brooks is a, just a tremendously skillful uh, rhymer, as is Richard Wilbur. Um, and, and when it's done well, it seems so effortless, but it's, it requires so much effort to do it as well as, as well as they do it. I'm going to check the time here real quick. Maybe I'll, I'll shift and share just a few of my poems, and then we can do a few more questions and answers if you all are interested. So I've got my newest book here, um, Odd Evening, and uh, I will maybe share a poem from that since we were talking about this one earlier. Topeka Magazine wanted to do a photo essay uh, called The Last Payphone in Topeka and asked if I would write a poem to accompany it. And I don't often write well on prompts or on commission, you know, but, but I was like, that, that really got the, the wheels turning in my mind. And so, so I ended up with this uh, short poem, The Last Payphone in Topeka. I'm trying to think if there's anything I need to say to preface it. But I'll just let it rip here. And then we can <laughs> you can ask questions if there's anything that you're curious about. The passing stranger used to jingle. Now he has no use for change. His ringtone is a CeeLo single, and you're the one who's passing strange. <laughs> when I approach you on your corner or in your stuffy entryway, I'll do it mutely, like a mourner. Respects are all I've come to pay. Payphone, I hope your standing slumber feels like a belly full of dimes <laughs> and sings you endless local number sequences like nursery rhymes. Two six six nine six three seven two three two four eight two nine three five four nine zero two seven and two three three five one zero oh, one, which was my grandmother until she moved herself to Brewster Place. The odd tetrameter can still summon a voice, but not a face. Payphone. I know the elegy is just another obsolete technology. Technology has stranded on another street. But so is everything worthwhile. Grandmothers, moonshots, shards of clay, the square of squares we tried to dial, the only tone that won't decay. When I uh, was writing that, I got to, we were talking earlier about uh, rotary dial phones and how foreign they look to children the age of, of our kids uh, these days. What is that strange thing? You know, they'll never know the pleasure or the frustration of having to dial a number really quickly and, and you know, because you're in a hurry and call someone and you look at it and, oh crap, it's got three zeros in it. You know, zero. <laughs> zero. <laughs> oh, come on. Um, and, and I got interested in the, the way that things outlive their usefulness in, in our language. Things become fossilized in idioms, you know, we still say that as a doornail and no one knows what the hell a doornail is, you know. Um, it's interesting that if you look at the keypad on a, on a payphone even, um, which is now itself an obsolete technology, uh, it's got this thing that we call a dial or that we say we'll dial it and it's a square of squares, you know, it's, it's as far from being a dial <laughs> geometrically as you can get, but we still dial it, which is, you know, punching, punching these squares. Um, those numbers, you know, it's funny to read a stanza that's just seven-digit telephone numbers in a poem. I read it in a place like Highland, and it's sort of amusing. If I read that poem in Topeka, I look at the audience and, and the people, I'm like, oh, yeah, 235, boy, that takes me back. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, 354, I have such memories of 354. <laughs> Those exchanges that we developed this sentimental attachment to. And I don't think it's a coincidence that uh, a seven-digit phone number is, as I say in the poem, a line of tetrameter, you know, two, three, two, nine, one, two, four. It's not just that it's seven syllables, it's that we throw emphasis on it, the first, third, fifth, and seventh syllables, precisely the same way we say, twinkle, twinkle, little star. London Bridge is falling down. Mary had a little lamb. We got spirit, yes we do. You know? <laughs> two, three, two, nine, one, two, four. That's where the stresses fall. In fact, if you move the stresses, um, so that they're on the, the second, fourth, and sixth um, number. It doesn't even sound like a phone number anymore. Hey, what's your phone number? Well, it's 2329124. That doesn't sound like a phone number, you know? <laughs> it sounds like I said too few numbers, you know? Um, those of us, uh, our generations are, are uh, we have a whole anthology of lines of tetrameter in our head, which are just 
phone numbers that we memorized that we had to commit to memory because they weren't in the memory of our <laughs> iPhone, you know. And and meter is a mnemonic, and I think that's one of the reasons we were able to memorize so many of them is because of that rhythm that was built into them. And that's that's something that I'm sorry my my kids don't know. I think my kids know our phone number, but that's it. You know, everything else is just press the button that says Andrea, and my phone will call Andrea. You know, so. Uh, these uh, these things are endlessly fascinating. To me. I sure like the image of the change, the pocket change. Yes. Is, I forgot how obscure that is. Guys don't sound like change pockets anymore. That's you another know? sound that's missing. That's yeah. right. Yeah, or that's less common. Yeah. You know. Yeah. Because we need parking meters, pay phones. The reason why we used to have some spare change, most of that is kind of gone. Uh huh. Yeah, that's right. Most of the things that we needed it for. Yeah. And so, yeah, it's just not so common. I'll, um, let's see, I'll share maybe one or two more. Here's another one that, uh, about that, that feeling of obsolescence. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Yeah. That one brought to mind the old party lines. Oh, yeah. That we had out in the country. We had eight parties on the line. Yeah. And I don't know why I jumped from the payphone to a party line, but it's, it's another I guess, it's somebody in the yeah, that's right. And yeah. so from one poem, you can take a leap and a jump into something that's related, but not not exactly there. Yeah, yeah. It's um, associated memories with what flings into it, for, <laughs> for sure. And and party lines predate me, um, but I, I remember hearing about them. And I have friends in Topeka who still have their same phone number that they've always had. And I'll say, oh, you still have... Two, three, five, six, nine, eight, eight. That's great. And they'll, see if they're older than me, they'll say, "Yeah, you know." And in fact, I've had it since it was Central Six Nine Eight Eight. It wasn't even there wasn't even a three-digit exchange originally. There was a, a region or an area, and then the, the four digits that followed. And so, yeah, we we uh, uh, live to, to see a lot of our own sort of obsolescences. <laughs> we live to see ourselves in the museum eventually. Um, as I was saying. Um, when we were speaking before, I, I came back to Topeka. Having grown up there, I moved away and was away for a long time. I came back in 2009 um, to take the job teaching at Washburn University. I've been away 13 years, and it's very strange to be back in your hometown after 13 years away because it really both is and isn't your hometown at the same time. And so I tried to grapple with that in a poem that's also here in Odd Evening, and it's called Your Back, Y O U apostrophe R E. Back and it's in four sections. I found that it was easier to write about things that were my own experience uh, if I made it in the second person. You know, so it, this is a poem about you moving back to your hometown. It's not about me moving back to mine. Um, it also freed me to lie a little bit more. I have a hard time writing first-person poems about things that didn't actually happen. Mm -hmm. So I, I could really embellish once I made it about you rather than about me. You're back. One. You went away and they went on without you. When you reappeared with kids and an ironic beard, the ticket carousel was full. They finally stopped taking orders from east of Dougal and redrawn the map's eccentric ballpoint borders, the dough hook dervished in its bowl. Home is where your references aren't recognized or needed. When you have to go back, they have to clock you in. <laughs> the only other differences were little changes to the menu. Nobody asked you where you've been. Two. Your daughter didn't have a single friend named Stephanie in soccer or at school. Nobody screamed the name at either end of the public pool. And you began to understand and mourn that there would have to be a great-grandmother named Stephanie before there could be another Stephanie born and the three Stephanies who gave the name its amplitude, the Stephanies of myth, kept showing up at Kroger and became the Stephanies you went to high school with. <laughs> three, you went away and they went on like that as though you hadn't gone, still doing it the way they'd learned to do it and that only they still do it and the only way as far as they're concerned. Then you came back and said I knew it and told them you were unaware of anybody anywhere still doing it the way they do it. <laughs> and they said, you don't say. <laughs> Four, only your first grade teacher looked the same, uncannily, because it was her daughter 
<laughs> she had the makeup and had kept the name. She even had the belly you could rub for good luck when she brought you in to sub. And she had plans to finish out the year, but you'd been through this once before. Her water would break in April, and she'd disappear for 30 years, and you'd be back like Cotter. <laughs> back to the blackboard, suddenly unsure of how best to distinguish your from your. Your back, and bigger. Better watch your back. Don't strain it, sipping from those tiny fountains. You're sad because your blackboard isn't black. You're teaching them your harmlessly subversive verse choruses to Cielito Lindo and other lovely, useless things like cursive. You're staring out <laughs> your modulars one window, turning the thunderheads to thunder mountains. That poem has a lot of obsolete technologies in it too, doesn't it? You know, the blackboard that's not black, but that we still call a blackboard, and the, uh, the, the cursive writing, and the name is Stephanie. I like that idea that like uh, one way your hometown has changed is that if you were there in 1982, the name Stephanie would just be in the air around you the same way that the sound of jingling change in pockets would be. But, but now you're back in 2009 and the name Stephanie is nowhere to be heard or because there, no one's shouting it because no, one, no, no child is named that. Now it's the adults that are named that. You know? um, and that it won't be back again until it's old enough that there's a great grandmother named Stephanie. Then it can become a fashionable name again. You know? Um, yeah, I think that the, the you know challenging process of confronting one's own middle age and, and uh, one's own mortality is, is made somewhat easier by being able to reckon with it in poetry or try to anyway. Well, we're at about six o'clock here. How about other questions or other comments or other things you'd like to? I haven't talked at all about being poet laureate. Sometimes people want to know what being poet laureate is all about. <laughs> so so. Um, I've, I've, I'm almost two years into a two-year term now, I'm almost done, and, and I've finally determined that the main job of the Poet Laureate is to go around the state answering the question, what is the main job of the Poet Laureate? <laughs> <laughs> uh, but it's also, I think, being, you know, what I, I said I fancy myself as, being an advocate for poetry, you know, being the Johnny Appleseed of poetry, going to uh, places that maybe don't have a whole lot of time to spend thinking about poetry, and making the case that poetry can have a place in in your lives. And it's odd that we have that for poetry and not for anything else. You know, it's odd that we have a, a poet laureate but not a saxophonist laureate or a sculptor laureate or a ballerina laureate or something like that. Um, but I think that maybe poetry sometimes needs a little bit of extra advocacy because, you know, it's made of language, right? Poetry is. A, a saxophone solo is made of musical notes and a, a painting is made of paint. Um, but um, a poem is made of language, which is something that, unlike musical notes, we use for other things, right? We use language for practical purposes all the time. We use it to make ourselves understood. I, I'm doing that right now. Um, and so we have expectations for what language will be, um, which is a way of coming to a point as quickly as possible and conveying something as clearly and, and with a single, non, uh, a single restrictive meaning um, as efficiently as possible. And that's not what poetry is trying to do, you know. And I think that people who are disappointed by poetry are often disappointed by it or feel that they don't have a connection with it because they expect poetry to do what language does in other situations, which is like give the pizza guy directions to your house, you know, or something like that, some very practical thing like that. Um, a poem isn't really trying to describe an experience, you know. A poem is trying to be an experience. And if you just step into the world of, poet, of the poem and, and let it paint a, a, an experience around you, then you're more likely to enjoy it than if you uh, grab it by the lapels and shake it and demand it, that it explain itself right away, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Demand that it come to the point. Or demand that it be a page turner, you know? We, uh, we, we praise books by calling them page turners. I was riveted, I was up all night reading. I, I kept turning it page after page. Um, the best poems for me are, are the opposite of page turners. I don't want to turn the page after I read it. I want to read that poem again. As you said of the Bean Eaters, you, it's a different poem each time, and you get more out of it each time. It's, it's a deeper and richer each time you return to it in a way that maybe prose isn't. And so the Bean Eaters is nobody's idea of a page turner, right? It's this very slow, understated poem, but you've got to step into it and dwell in it to, to perceive its richness, I think. So anyway, a lot of what I do as Poet Laureate is just go around making this case to people, you know, slow down and take 
poems one word at a time and, and give them the, the attention that their author gave them. And uh, if you've done that and you find that you still don't like the poem, good, you know? That means you have taste in poetry. It doesn't mean that you lack taste in poetry. If you read a poem and dislike it, it means you have taste. That's the definition of taste, is knowing what you like and what you dislike. I'm the poet laureate. It's my job to like poetry. And I'm pretty indifferent to like 49 out of every 50 poems that I read. You know, I have to read a lot of poetry to find one that I want to read more by that author, you know? The same way that you have to listen to 50 songs before you hear one that makes you think, I want to download that album. You know what I mean? You don't do that with every song that you hear on the radio. Um, but nor do you turn off the radio when you hear a song that you dislike and say, well, that's it for music. I'm not listening to any more music. I can't have a chance. But people do that with poetry, you know? They read a poem in the New Yorker, and they're like, what the hell is that? I don't get that poem. I guess I just don't like poetry. And they put it aside. You know? uh, you've got to give it many chances in order to find the ones that are going to connect with you. So, yeah. so that's my, my shtick as, as poet laureate. And it's sponsored by the Kansas Humanities Council. They've been very generous and supportive. It's been, it's been a wonderful two years. How do you think you could be a poet they put out a call for applications every two oh, years. Oh, Yeah, is. yeah. And uh, they're actually in the process of choosing the next one right now. Um, who's they? Uh, the Kansas Humanities Council. And they, they put together a board of um, a selection committee that comprises oh, really? um, English professors and other poets and uh, arts um, supporters and patrons and uh, folks like that um, to, uh, to make the selection as a committee. So, yeah. so you put an application in try to make the best case for yourself that you can. <laughs> Other questions or comments? Anything else for the good living order? Well, this has just been a real treat talking to you all. And, uh, and sometimes you speak to a group of eight and it feels like you're speaking to a thousand. This has been uh, a <laughs> final joy of this job. That as many times as I've been over those poems that I shared with you, I learn new things about them each time from talking about them with uh, folks like you. And I, and I see them in, in a new light again.